Here's a poem called The Missing of You Hurts. Now, pause and try to read this, okay? And I don't feel bad saying this. This is a horrible poem. Objectively, it's a terrible poem. It's not just like me being mean. It's a awful poem. And in fact, <clears throat> just so you know I'm not being a total jerk, it comes from this chapter in a book in the palm of your hand, and it's called Awful Poems, and that is the poem it begins with. Now the question really becomes, why is this poem so bad? That's a list you want to make so you will avoid it at all costs. So number one, the word climb, like the word evermore, even a case could be made for oh. These are archaic words. You do not speak like this. In poetry that you're writing today, you really want to use your own voice, right? The problem with a lot of poets is they haven't read much poetry, at least not anything written in the 21st century. The vast majority of student poets read poetry in high school that was assigned to them, the dead white guys. And most of the time they had to have that poetry explained to them because it's hard to understand. And they used the and thou and sing song, you rhyme and whatnot. <clears throat> we have a bit of a rhyme scheme. Time, care, true, climb, climb and time. So that would be like A, B, C, A. And then out, about, repair, you. So it's inconsistent, right? If you wanted to do a rhyme scheme, and here's another rule, it does not have to rhyme. But if you did want to do a rhyme scheme, you should probably be consistent. A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. There's lots of formal sonnets and other things that ask for that. We're not gonna do any formal rhyme poetry. If rhyming comes up in your poetry, that's cool. I highly discourage a lot of end rhyme because that's cliche in a lot of ways. If you're not doing it right, and if you open any book of contemporary poetry right now, you'll see very little end rhyme, right? Where the rhyme is anticipated, and it just sort of beats you over the head. If you're writing a song, you're gonna have that, you need that. One of the reasons I don't love end rhyme is because often it creates this forced syntax. Like this is not the actual syntax of a sentence you would use. For you know I still carry you in my heart. Carry you in my heart, another cliche. No matter even if you did that day depart. You don't talk like that. They're trying to force this rhyme, so they've had to revise a sentence so it sort of sounds more poetic and you end on heart and depart. I'm not saying to avoid rhyme, I'm just saying don't do it in a sing-songy, repetitive, obvious way, okay? We're not writing Hallmark cards, we're writing poetry that people hopefully will read and be inspired by, entertained by. Other reasons this poem sucks, bad metaphor left me like the tide that goes out. Okay, there's water and it's going out. And we can never stop or get it repaired. Repaired tide. This is not a car that's going into the auto shop to get repaired. It's the water. So this should be something you could try to connect these two. You left me like the tide that goes out and I drown in your absence, it's not bad. You left me like the tide that go out and I was lost without a life preserver. S shit that connects tide and water. Otherwise you have a bad metaphor or what's called a mixed metaphor. It's cliche. You left me here to feel this way, like I am dead inside. Dead inside, there's about a thousand ways you can say dead inside in a more interesting way. That's a cliche. Another huge problem in this poem for me is there's like hardly any imagery, right? The only thing that sort of evokes an image in my head where I can truly see it and not have it told to me is maybe sweet hazel eyes. But everything else is just a lot of telling. Like where's the image? Where's the rendered image? Another thing I despise about this poem this is all just a lot of telling, just a lot of telling and not a lot of showing. I mean, it's okay to communicate these emotions, but you want the reader to feel emotion. You don't want to just tell them how to feel. So this stanza, I often cry thinking of you know who and your last goodbye. And indeed to me, it's a huge question mark why. On some level, it's okay, but on another level, it's so self-pitying and so generic that it really doesn't communicate to a reader any real emotion. I think as a rule, the less you talk about emotions in a general way, the better. Let me say that again. 
the less you talk about emotions in a general way, the better. Don't be too intimidated. Let me contrast this with a better ball. For you, I undress down to the sheath of my nerves. Now stop right there, it's already better. For you, I undress, I mean, that's, that's all that's better. Down to the sheaths of my nerves. So she didn't just take clothes off, metaphorically, man, she took her skin off. That's how much love she's willing to give. I removed my jewelry and set it on the nightstand. Okay, clear, simple, nightstand, jewelry, specific. I unhook my ribs. Spread my lungs flat on a chair. Now this is very interesting language. This might be another way of saying he took my breath away, for example. I dissolve like a remedy in water in wine. Ugh. Instead of saying, for example, I loved him so much, I dissolve like a remedy, like I'm just an Alka-Seltzer and you're a tall glass of water. I spill without staining and leave without stirring the air. Uh-oh, mystery. She's quiet, she's leaving. I do it for love. For love, I disappear. Now there's a bit of a rhyme. You've got some S sounds, you've got some rhyme, air, chair, disappear, right? There's some rhyme here, but it doesn't dominate. What dominates is this very cryptic, mysterious, subtle story that I think is about an affair. We can assume that, right? For love, for love, I disappear as if not to stain, not to stir the air, not to let wifey know I'm hair. I'm trying to rhyme too, right? But what actually is going on here in a really wonderful way is you've got nice, nice imagery with some really eloquent language in order to communicate that. And instead of cliches, you've really taken out the cliches and created all kinds of new phrasings that sort of mean similar things. So this one is by Kim Adonisio, and it's pretty good. So what's the takeaway? Write like this, not like that. <laughs> keep reading poems and keep identifying what is cliche and what is not, what is archaic and what is not, what is nice visual figurative language and what is not, what is a clear metaphor, what is a mixed metaphor. Like start reading poems, not just for their content, but read like a writer reads, read for craft. How are they doing what they're doing, okay? All right.